Thank you, Sham. Uh, so the premise of this workshop is a question of where next for theory of deep learning. To, to understand where to go next, uh, we really have to consider where we are now. And I will start by describing where we have been. So the classical setting for uh, machine learning, for most analysis of machine learning, is um, so-called empirical risk minimization. You take uh, a space of functions, H, and you minimize the training loss or the empirical risk over that space of functions. Now, to understand how the analysis for this works, you have to look at um, the comparison between the goal of machine learning and the goal of empirical risk minimization. The goal of machine learning is to find a function which will minimize the loss in the future. And in the sort of usual statistical setting, this is just to say that the expected loss over the probability distribution and uh, you know, some standard assumptions, uh, you want to find the function which minimizes the expected loss. In comparison, the goal of the empirical risk minimization is to find a function of a um, which minimizes the loss over the training data from some class of functions. Now, how do you compare this? So this is the classical approach. You, um, according to Wapnik, there are two aspects of this. First, the theory of induction, as he calls it, is based on the uniform law of large numbers. Second, effective methods of inference must include capacity control. So what is uh, the uniform law of large numbers? Uniform laws of large numbers say that empirical loss of any function in H is approximately equal to the expected loss for, any function, for, for that function. So it allows us to compare empirical loss to the expected loss. What is capacity control? Capacity control is basically nothing else but just saying that H contains functions that approximate the goal of machine learning, F star. Now, if you have one and two, it's not hard to see that your ERM solution is nearly optimal. That's how this analysis works. Let me now unpack a little bit the meaning of the empirical um, the the uniform law of large numbers. So me, uniform laws of large numbers are what you may call the weak bound. What you see is what you get. And there are a large number of these bounds, and there are quite a few of analysis of this form. Basically, on the left, it's an inequality, right? And on the left, in this inequality, you have the expected risk. This is what you get. This is what, what the future is. On the right, you have the empirical risk. This is what you see on your training data, plus a capacity term. And this term is usually of something like square root of C over N, when C is a measure of the capacity of your class. It may be a margin. It may be VC dimension. There are a number of different ways to measure this. Now, I would like to point out that margin and other a posteriori bounds are still of the same form, but they allow H the space of functions to be data dependent. For example, you can consider functions which have some margin. OK, so this is the, this is the basic uniform of law of large numbers. Now, what about capacity control? Well, essentially, capacity control is choosing H so that C can be traded off with the empirical loss. How does this work? Well, this is from Wapnik's book. Uh, you have, as you increase the capacity of the space, your empirical loss go down. The bound, the capacity goes up. So the total bound first goes down and then up again. It's a U-shaped curve. And the optimal uh, hypothesis is at the bottom of that U. Now, the way it's usually represented is a slightly more heuristical way. is something like this. When you increase the model complexity, your training loss goes down, your test loss goes down and then up again. The left part of this, we, oops, sorry. Uh, the left part of this is underfitting, the right is overfitting, and the goal in this way of thinking is to find the sweet spot, which is this bottom of the U curve. 
Now, um, a sort of informal corollary of this is that a model of with zero training error, which is you know, here somewhere, is overfit and will generalize poorly. For future reference, we will call this interpolation. This is along the mathematical definition of the term. OK. How do you uh, now verify this empirically? And I think an important result was from the paper by Zhang et al. 2017, who pointed out that you can actually interpolate, and yet you get good accuracy. So you have 100% accuracy. This is a neural network trained on CIFAR-10. You have 100% training accuracy. Yet the test accuracy is still pretty good. You don't see overfitting, or at least it's not large. Now, this is already um, troubling, right? Because it certainly contradicts the informal corollaries that I had before. It is not clear that this, on its own, contradicts to the ARM theory as such. I will now give some evidence which actually this type of effect does contradict the bounds themselves. And uh, this is uh, from our paper with my students, Siyuan Ma and Sumik Mandel. The, the experiment is the following, and I apologize for the complexity of this graph. There are basically different models. You can just concentrate on the Laplace kernel here. Um, what we do, we take uh, MNIST, which is a 10-class data set, and we randomize a certain percentage of the training set, like 10, 20, 30, and so on percent, and the corresponding percent of the test set. So what do I mean by randomization? I take 10% of the data and I assign random labels. Now, the green line here is the best you can possibly do. So if you have 50% of your data with random labels, then you cannot do much better than 50%, no matter what algorithm you use. You can do slightly better because sometimes just by randomness you guess correctly. But it's essentially just under 50%. So the green line is the best that you can possibly get. That's the base optimal classifier. The random guess is at 90% because it's a 10 class. Now, you can see that the red line kind of tracks the green line. And what is this red line? It's a kernel machine trained to have zero loss on the noisy data. So, and by zero loss, I mean zero square loss. And how zero it is, it is actually numerically zero. It's something like 10 to the minus 26. So you cannot have anything much lower than that in a computer. So despite this extreme interpolation, oh, like true mathematical interpolation, it doesn't seem to overfit. And in fact, the amount, well, I don't know whether you can call it overfitting or not, but it, it tracks the green line very closely within a few percent. So that is, um, well, can that be explained using those bounds? Um, because certainly it's something quite counterintuitive. Well, uh, let's think about it. Can a bound of this form explain what we saw there? Well, first notice that the training loss here is zero. So what you must have is that the test loss is bounded directly by the complexity term. Well, what would that imply? If you have a bound like that, let's look at this graph again. Let me look at a point where say with fairly high level of noise, say 80%. I can see that the best is about 70%, random is 90%. So if I want my bound to be correct, it has to be bigger than 70%. If I want it to be non-trivial, it has to be smaller than 90%. Well, you can of course have more than 90%, but that's random guess, that's a useless bound. And you can see that that's the only way in which you can describe this, Laplace, this behavior of Laplace kernel. Other methods like neural networks are very similar. Now, uh, what is happening here? So here is what we have. We want to have a complexity term, which is between 0.7 and 0.9. Well, um, there are two problems with having a bound like that. First. The constant in this O star has to be exact. Needless to say, there are no log terms, nothing. Nothing is allowed here. It has to be an exact contents within one plus epsilon. We don't have any bounds like that. Well, you can say, well, maybe, okay, so what we don't have? Maybe we can tighten some bounds that we have. But there is a sort of more troubling conceptual issue with this. If you have a bound like that, then somehow C of N must know about this 0.7. 
This 0.7 is the base optimal. So how would complexity, well, think about what is complexity. It's some sort of margin or uh, VC dimension of the space or some other quantity like that. How would it know about the base optimal? It just has no way to know. So it's really neither we have bounds like that, nor it can be expected mathematically that we could, or at least, it, yeah, I, I don't see how it's possible. Uh, so what is happening there? Well, despite the fact that this seems to be very um, problematic from the bound point of view, this does seem to be the practice of um, deep learning. And in fact, from Ruslan's tutorial, he basically says the best way to solve the problem is that you get zero training error. Well, this is not the last thing, and you, you tune the parameters and so on. But even at this point, you're already ending up with something which works pretty well. And that's clearly exactly like what I had in the slide before. Now, I should point out that there, is, uh, there has been a recognition of this fact that there is very troubling from the point of view of uh, usual statistical analysis. Jan said it on a number of uh, occasions. And uh, uh, quite a while back, um, Leo Bryman wrote a note called Reflections After Referring Papers for NIPS. He asked several questions. The first one was, why don't heavily parameterized networks overfeed the data? This was written in 95. So 20 years, 24 years to be precise, and I think now we're starting to get some answers. But first, let me point out, I think this is the first lesson of deep learning, and that's maybe where we are now, is that the new theory of induction, or the theory of induction that we want to have, cannot be based on uniform laws of large numbers with capacity control they're not going to be able to explain it. I think we have to accept this. Yeah, then. And so, uh, so when, you know, when Batnick was studying uniform laws, I think, or like in the CAC framework, it's not just uniform over the space of hypotheses, but generally the aesthetic is uniform over all distributions. So if you build like a Rademacher bound, that, it, that specializes in the distribution now in our, in our That's why I said margin bounds. You can make this data dependent by forcing the margin, but it has the same problem. Well, I mean, margin is very, is very crucial to, to... I understand, but I'm saying no tool of this form can help here because you still have a bound of the same form, even localized Rademacher or whatever you like. You know, it's not going to help because you have this WYSIWYG kind of bound. Is what you see is what you get, right? If one part is zero, the Rademacher complexity is not magically going to know about the base risk. It's a, it's a fundamental, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There may be other algorithms, but for the algorithm, for say Laplace kernel or for those neural networks which are trained to have zero loss, the bounds will not hold. Certainly there are other algorithms. I'm not saying that the bounds themselves are wrong or that you know, they don't hold. They just don't hold for the algorithm that we are using here. That's, I think, is important. Thank you for pointing this out. This is an important point. You mean they're vacuous? They are vacuous for the algorithm that we have. They're not vacuous for other yes. algorithms. OK, that l l I should continue. So the question, of course, is where next? And I'll let's just very briefly look at what we have. And we can see that uh, the complexity bounds are not going to help us. Algorithmic stability, which is another common type of analysis, has similar issue. It's a different type of bound, but it's a, of a similar kind. Now, regularization type of analysis are very different, of somewhat different nature, but they still have the same problem because almost all of them, they diverge for when, like early stopping, for example, will diverge if you run your algorithm to completion. And Tikhonov would diverge when lambda goes to zero and so on. So these things diverge. There is, however, one type of analysis for which these limitations don't seem to apply, at least on the surface, and this is a classical smoothing method. And the most famous of them are just nearest neighbors. And in fact, there is one classical algorithm for which we know something like what we want holds, and this is one nearest neighbor classifier. This is a fantastic, actually, method. Um, it's an interpolating classifier. 
It has a non-trivial and reasonably good guarantee. It's uh, twice the base risk uh, due to covering hard back in the 60s. Analysis is not based on complexity bounds, and we directly estimate the expected loss. We don't actually deal with the generalization loss. Now, the question is, well, can we do something like that, but better? Because this is not statistically optimal. This is uh, not even consistent. And the answer is yes. And very briefly, there is an algorithm which you can view as a weighted interpolating nearest neighbor. So you do nearest neighbors, but the weight is something like inverse distance. And it's closely related to something called Shepard's interpolation. Uh, it is easy to see that this algorithm, if you look at the math, uh, must be interpolating. And you can prove, actually, that it's, it's, it's consistent. And moreover, in fact, it's actually statistically op It's consistent for classification. It's, stati it's um, statistically optimal for regression. And, uh, this is uh, joint work with Daniel Su and part Dimitri and a follow-up with Sasha Rocklin and Sasha Tsibakov. Uh, I would like to sort of give a simple example of what's happening here. So imagine that through that this data, little circles, a sample from this line plus some noise in the y direction. Now, if you know a priori, the blue line is the perfect solution. So you cannot do better than that. However, well, the algorithm, of course, doesn't know the blue line. And what if you do this, what you would see, you would see this kind of crazy function. And you say, well, this is a terrible function. It looks awful. At no data point, it is close to the blue line. But actually, if you look at a random point in this interval, you will see that for a random point, it's quite close. And the more data you get, the closer you get to the blue line, on average. So. There is some reason to believe this phenomenon is actually strong in high dimension. There is some sort of blessing of dimensionality going on, but I, I, I don't want to talk about this. Uh, let me just give you a very quickly one corollary of this. And the corollary is kind of interesting. So we've seen uh, Alexander gave a very nice talk yesterday about uh, adversarial examples. And we have seen, you know, you have an image like this. This is a dog. You add some invisible noise to it, and the neural network now is classifying it as an ostrich, right? So what's going on? Well, it turns out, if you take this point of view of interpolation seriously, you can prove that if the labels are not deterministic, if there is, no, if there is any label noise at all, then the space of, then the set of this adversarial example is actually asymptotically dense. So around every point, you will have infinitely, well, arbitrary number of these adversarial examples. Now, um, I'm not going to claim that this is really how adversarial examples arise in practice. We don't know that, and there are other mechanisms. But that shows that actually the predictions are kind of very consistent with what you see. In OK. Now, uh, let me move on. So this talk so far, well, well I've showed that Empirically, interpolation is effective. Second, the theory of interpolation cannot be based on uniform bounds. And third, if that there are certain nearest neighbor methods which actually consistent with interpolation, uh, interpolate, and statistically optimal. But you can say, well, OK, this is all great. But how does it actually relate to the methods we use in practice? You know, things like neural nets. And um, certainly, this interpolating nearest neighbor seem to be a very different kind of algorithm. Now, there are several uh, key questions that you may ask here. And, you know, first, how do classical analysis relate to interpolation? Is there a bias variance straight off? Is there a U curve? Second, what is it dependent on model complexity? Is model complexity irrelevant completely? Third, what is the role of optimization here? We have partial answers. I, I don't claim to have the full answers, but we do have partial answers now. Uh, here is the sort of first part of the answer. And if you look at the classical risk curve, you can see that you, as you increase the complexity of your hypothesis space, your training loss, training or training risk goes down, your test risk goes on this U-shaped curve. 
you go through it from underfitting to overfitting. Now, what is the point at the right end of this curve? It is the point where the loss is equal to zero, right? Because classically, you don't train beyond this point. Now, in the modern setting, there is nothing which prevents you. Well, actually, classically, too, but we sort of didn't think about it. You can even do it for linear regression. But certainly, nothing prevents you from taking, say, a neural network of arbitrary size, right? So why end here? And once you realize that there is nothing special about this point, you can continue this curve. And what you see is very interesting. You see that once you pass beyond this point of interpolation, the interpolation threshold, you have a second stage of the curve. And in fact, the loss on the test, the test loss goes down again. We call the double descent because it has these two descending regions. The first one is the classical one, and the second one is a modern one. Interestingly enough, at least in most examples that we consider, it appears that the second one goes, decreases indefinitely. Of course, it doesn't go to zero, and it's not always lower than the bottom of the U. But it does, it is a strictly decreasing function. And I'll, I'll give some arguments why this should be true. Yeah, question? Yeah. Just think about it as a number. It's a little more complicated than that, but we can just think of the number of parameters. That's the cleanest way. Um, what's the question again? I don't think so, no. I, I don't believe that. Yeah. So the uh, complex is measured in the uh, bicycle, you see, and the modern is in the other same measure of the admission The easier thing is just think about the number of parameters in which they're the same, but there are some more complicated cases, or it can be even something like the number of steps of gradient descent, but I would rather not go there because the things are less clean. But yeah, just the number of parameters is the easiest way to think about this. Yeah. We'll talk about it. There is definitely something which is going on, but it's not a classical complexity measure. Like it's not something you can plug in the bound or something like that. It's, it's some sort of norm, but we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this. Yeah. You will see that something else decreases. But it's not, it's not the complexity measure as we sort of usually think about it. Um, OK, so now let me try to convince you that this is actually the case. Uh, we've done a bunch of experiments, different data sets, uh, fully connected network, random forest, random networks, uh, even 1D simulated data. You, you can, this is a very robust phenomenon. You can, just, you, you can get it uh, pretty much every time. Uh, I should also point out that other people also have observed it in at least two papers. Um, now, the interesting thing, however, is what is the mechanism underlying? Like, why would, would we expect this to be the case? And uh, let me first give you a very simple, and I hope intuitive example of why this is true. So let's just look at 11, this is 11 points, I believe, in one dimensional space. Um, and I'm just using 30 random ReLU features. So it's a fixed first layer neural network with 30 neurons, okay? So really, really simple. With random weight, so I'm fixing the first layer weight. Uh, and you can see that with 30 ReLU features, I can get zero loss. There are enough parameters here. But it's quite jagged. Now, if I take 300 ReLU features, it's a much nicer curve certainly looks a lot better visually. And with 3,000 ReLU features, it's essentially the same as with 300. There is no visual difference. Now, uh, one interesting thing is that all of the things are piecewise linear, but you cannot actually see that. Too many pieces. Now, um, so that's kind of uh, a sort of at least visual um, manifestation of this phenomenon. Now let me give you a more mathematical description of this. Yeah, question. This is just one layer. Oh, well, two layers, right? But the first layer is fixed. It's a, ran it's a random feature kind of map. Yeah. Uh, so, and I'm going to show with random Fourier features introduced by Rahim and Recht. 
Um, so what are random Fourier features? It is essentially a neural network with a special nonlinearity. The nonlinearity is a complex exponential. You can just think of this as sines and cosines. And the nice thing about this is that this neural network, you actually know what happens when the size of this neural network goes to infinity. And that was in the original paper. And it just converges to the Gaussian kernel machine. So you actually know exactly what the limit is. And the cool thing is that this gives you a very nice kind of uh, platform to just analyze the properties of this. And here is what you see. This is on a real data set on Timet uh, speech, actually. Um, so initially, there are 10,000 data points. So up to 10,000, you get the classical U-curve. At 10,000, you have the number of features which is equal to the number of data points. Your loss is zero. The training loss, you get the interpolation peak. And then beyond that, you get drop, the second descent, and it goes to this red line. And the red line is simply the kernel machine trained with the same data. So uh, what we observe is completely consistent with the theory of what we would expect. Now, the question is, well, why is it getting better as I am increasing the number of features? And the explanation is rather simple. Is that the kernel machine in the limit is a neural net which actually minimizes a certain norm. Now, as I am increasing the number of features, the space of solutions that I have, which interpolate the data, all of them interpolate the data here, all of them have zero loss, grows, right? Because the more features I have, my number of constraints is equal to the number of training points. So, number of features is actually um, well, the number of uh, solutions grows linearly with the number of features. And when I look for the solution with a minimum norm, which is what I do here, it approximates the true minimum norm solution in the functional space better and better. So really what is happening is that my minimum norm solution in the random feature space is approximating this minimum norm solution in the limit, in the infinity. And because it's a special form of the Gaussian kernel, I can actually compute that explicitly, and I can compare them. Now, to sort of verify it, you can just compute the norm of the solution, and you see that the norm of the solution indeed peaks here, which is exactly what you would expect, and then it drops. And at, say, 60,000 uh, features, it's essentially the same as the number of the true reproducing kernel Hilbert space solution. The picture is consistent. So that's why more features is actually better approximation. And that's why more features always help here, because you're getting closer and closer to the solution that you want. That solution with a minimum norm solution may not be great. There may be other solutions which are better. But more features helps you to get there. Now, if you look at the norm for this one, you can see that the norm indeed drops as you're increasing the number of random features. So again, this is consistent. All right, now you can prove something. Uh, so in the noiseless case, you can show that infinite width is actually optimal. Oh, well, close to optimal in any case. Um, let me skip this. Uh, now, another way to increase smoothness, so you see this minimizing this functional norm is actually choosing functions which are most smooth. And there is another way to do it. And another way to do it is by averaging, right? So if I average a bunch of things which are not so smooth, you're actually getting something which is smoother. So what I can do here, and this is something called PERT, in fact, was introduced in 2001. Um, you can take trees which interpolate the data, and you can average those trees. These are random trees. And it, each tree is pretty bad. But when you average a whole ensemble of them, you're getting a classifier which interpolates, and it's better than any individual tree, actually significantly better than any individual tree. So again, you have the same kind of mechanism but with a different underlying kind of gears in it. Even in linear regression, we can now observe this, and I think it's quite, in, there's been quite a bit of work actually just in the last year on this, um, including our paper. Um, there is, uh, it's I think quite remarkable that for something like linear regression, we can find something new, which at least haven't been I don't know. It was probably observed before, but certainly it didn't register. Uh, okay. 
Now, here is what I would suggest as a kind of replacement for ARM or, or complement, if you wish, to ARM. So ARM would be the mechanism for describing the U, and this would be describing the kind of new, this new world, which is on the right side of that curve. You, it's, um, it's kind of an Occam's razor. Sanjeev actually mentioned Occam's razor yesterday. This is, a, this is a different form of the Occam's razor. You basically want to maximize smoothness subject to interpolating the data. And if somehow your measure of smoothness is correct, then your generalization should be controlled by the smoothness. Now, there are three ways to increase the smoothness. There is explicit, which is just minimizing the functional norm, and that's what we do for kernels when we solve them explicitly. There is implicit by HDD optimization. We do it for kernels. For neural networks, we believe something like that is happening. There are various analyses now which indicate that in some appropriate limit this is happening. I mean, the story is still far from complete. And there is also averaging, which is the averaging, for example, trees. Now, uh, quite remarkably, actually, for kernel machines, all of the things coincide. And the first one is explicit solution. The second one is optimization. And the third one is actually Gaussian process view. Like for Gaussian kernels, you can um, average the trajectories. It's the same thing. OK, so let me um, summarize this part of the talk. And then I won't very briefly discuss optimization, since this is kind of an important aspect of this. You have this curve. On the left, you have the kind of classical world. On the right, you have the new world when your description is based on inductive biases subject to the interpolation conditions. And um, the interesting thing, I think, is quite remarkable thing from deep learning is that it really gives us a new understanding of overfitting. Because classically, we think, well, if the training loss is low, we must be overfitting. And therefore, we should decrease the number of parameters, right? either by introducing some extra regularization or by doing something else, which is essentially similar. Now, we understand that overfitting is not actually tied to the loss. It's a range. It's a band in the space of parameters. And there are two ways of dealing with overfitting. One way is to decrease the number of parameters, and that's a classical way. The other way is to increase the number of parameters, moving to the right. And that's amazing, because that's actually very, very counterintuitive from you know, the point of view of uh, you know, sort of classical view on the things. You can just basically take a large model here. So if your model is not large enough, just throw a bunch of extra parameters in it. And you, how much time? Three minutes. OK. Um, yeah. So all right, so let me very briefly point out a couple of things about optimization. I don't have time, obviously, to describe it in detail. But in classical setting, we have many local minima. SGD with a fixed step size doesn't converge, right? It just oscillates. To make it converge, you have to decrease the step size, or you have to do averaging or some other trick like that. Here is the kind of new world. Uh, when you are sufficiently overparameterized, there are no local minima. Every local minimum is global. Local minima, a local method converge to global optimum, something on which there have been a lot of work. And uh, finally, I want to just say a couple more words about the last point, is that small batch SGD with fixed step size converge as fast as GD per iteration. On the other hand, an iteration of SGD with a small batch size is far less computationally intense than a full GD. Because an iteration of SGD is an epoch. Iteration of SGD is a small fraction of an epoch. And um, maybe I'll keep this. Uh, basically, here is the theorem. Uh, I put it in quotes since I'm not explaining it in any detail. There is, um, if you take the Hessian, Something like trace of Hessian divided by the first eigenvalue is uh, this critical mini batch size. And if you take SGD with this step size, with this batch size, an optimal step size, you essentially equivalent to GD up to some small multiplicative constant. Now, 
In this particular example, it's eight. So if you have one million data points, instead of doing one million, you're doing eight, your saving is one million over eight. What does it mean? That means that for optimization, you have the following. You have a parameter, parameterization. It leads to interpolation. And then you do fast SGD and run it on the GPU. SGD computational gain is n over m star. If m star is 8, like we had before, this is 10 to the 6 over 8, roughly 100,000. And if you think of GPU as getting you another factor of um, 100, overall you have 10 million. So 10 million SGD on GPU is 10 million times faster than GD on CPU. And that's the difference between a second and four months. Just from that. OK, let me, we can actually learn from deep learning, and we can construct very efficient kernel methods. But let me skip this, since I'm out of time. Let me now um, go over the point. First, I think ARM cannot be a sole foundation for modern machine learning. We have now first analysis for this inductive biases instead of uniform laws of large numbers. And we have to think about this systematically. Second, the concept, the key concept is interpolation. It's not over parameterization. If you look at classical method, there are many which are infinitely over parameterized. It's really not in terms of how many parameters you have. It's what the loss is. Empirical loss is a useful optimization target. It's not a meaningful statistic for the expected loss in these regimes. And finally, optimization is really different on the interpolation. And in particular, SGD is overwhelmingly faster than GD. So that's kind of the total picture. A classical model, you have to choose careful par parameters carefully to get to the bottom of the U. The modern model, you just throw a lot of parameters at the problem, and you get good performance and easy optimization. It's quite amazing. <laughs> so I'll stop at that point. I would like to acknowledge my wonderful students and collaborators. <laughs>